All right. Good evening and welcome. My name is Kelly Hannon. I'm communications manager for VDOT Fredericksburg district. Thank you for attending tonight's public meeting and discussion of route 1 in Spotsylvania County. In a few moments, we'll start a presentation on our study of route 1 and meet the study team. But 1st, I just wanted to go over a few quick notes about tonight's meeting and the guidelines. This meeting is being recorded and it will be available for viewing on our project website after this meeting. It's generally posted around 24 hours afterward. After the presentation, staff will be available to answer your questions and accept comments. We will keep everyone muted throughout the duration of the meeting just to minimize background noise and ensure that everyone can hear. When it is time to ask questions, we will ask you to unmute yourself when you're called on or we will unmute you. There'll be an opportunity to participate if you have joined the meeting by phone or by using the online chat feature in the lower right corner of your screen. And we'll also go over the specific directions again just before we begin the comment and discussion portion. So at this time, I will turn it over to our study team and start the presentation. <coughs> All right. Well, uh, Kelly, I think uh, I'm going to go ahead and get this started here. Um, my name is Kyle Bates. I'm actually the resident engineer with VDOT for the Fredericksburg residency. Um, I wanted to, to real quick just uh, talk a little bit about uh, what we're going to be doing here today. So you're going to be seeing um, this study on Route 1 through Spotsylvania County. Uh, this is a planning level study. Um, there's going to be uh, a lot of different uh, planning level graphics that you may see. I think it's important to know that um, some of these graphics that you're, you're going to see throughout this presentation, um, none of these are funded necessarily. These are not existing projects, but what this, these studies allow us to do as a department is take some of that information, these st this, this engineering studies that we have, and at a later date, uh, you know, if there's an application that we want to apply for or the locality wants to apply for, we have what we'll call shelf-ready projects that can um, be applied for directly uh, based off of this study. Not to mention that, uh, you know, with the VA hospital recently awarded in Spotsylvania County, uh, right at the 126 exit at Route 1 and 95, um, there's a lot of development coming to the area all up and down Route 1, especially uh, with the 606 project getting ready to go to uh, add within the next uh, year or so here. Um, there's a lot of uh, development coming to that area as well. And so it's important that we have these shelf ready projects when those times come that we have available funding. So uh, we do do this in partnership with the locality. I know Paul Agnello is here from Spotsylvania County who has been uh, a uh, significant partner in, in a lot of this process. So uh, with that, Paul is going to turn it over to you if you had anything you wanted to mention. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Kyle. And I just want to uh, briefly introduce myself. I'm Paul Agnello. Basically, I work for Spotsylvania County as the Assistant Director for Transportation Planning. I said that we are very supportive of this study. Uh, as Kyle Bates said, basically this uh, corridor is um, expecting a lot of growth basically in the coming years. And uh, with the study basically developing the recommended improvements, this will kind of help guide uh, just the suite of transition projects that we can basically work with the state uh, to try to get funding for in the coming years. I also want to thank uh, FAMPO for their support for, the, for this study. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Well, with that, we'll uh, we'll continue on. And uh, at this point, I'll turn it over to the project team. Uh, Chris, uh, we'll start with you. Great. Thanks, Kyle. Good evening. Uh, my name is Chris Teasler. I'm a principal engineer with Kittleson and Associates, and uh, I have two other colleagues with me this evening. Hi, I'm Andy Butzik, a senior engineer with Kittleson Associates, part of the project team as well. Hi, I'm Liz Farm. I'm an engineer associate with Kittleson. All right. Well, we can uh, jump in and uh, Andy, next slide. I'm so sorry, I passed like the light. Okay. Uh, well, the goals of this meeting. Um, well, we appreciate you joining us this evening to talk about the Route 1 corridor. And, and really, this is an opportunity this evening for the project team to share with you, again, just why the study is happening, um, what we've already learned through this process so far. Again, this is our second public meeting. Um, we had a, a, a meeting earlier, um, earlier on in the project. 
But this is really an opportunity to share with you some preliminary alternatives, as Kyle said, of potential improvements that could be implemented down the road um, and what those next steps look like. And, and of course, perhaps most importantly, to answer any questions you may have at this point um, after you've seen this information, um, we're here to help uh, in, inform you and, and answer those questions. And so, next slide. Um, before we jump in, um, again, just going to remind you as as Kelly mentioned, at the bottom right, you'll see a chat box. And this is where, as we go through the presentation, feel free to type in a question at any time. Um, we will be reviewing those. And at the end, when we get to the question and answer portion of our presentation, um, we'll use that um, to take those questions and, and get them answered for you. And so with that, uh, I think we can jump in. So why is this study happening? Um, I think both Kyle and Paul mentioned um, there's quite a bit of growth anticipated along this corridor in Spotsylvania County um, over the next 10 years. And so um, our study area in Spotsylvania County here um, is just starts just south of Spotsylvania Parkway, Commonwealth Drive being the first intersection, um, extending all the way south down to Arcadia Road, um, close to the Caroline County border. Um, so along this corridor, I think we have 13 separate study intersections that we focused on. And of course, we've looked also at along the corridor systemically at what's going along between those intersections and what we might be able to achieve um, or address with that as well. Next slide. Okay. So we, we did have a, a purpose and need statement developed at the beginning of that uh, of this project. Um, first of all, it's to address multimodal concerns. With this growth, we anticipate not only automobile traffic uh, growing over time, but really the need for pedestrian bicycle connectivity and even the emerging need for some transit and how best to plan for that. Um, we want to assess the future travel demand patterns and development patterns so that we can be proactive in identifying solutions for anticipated needs and not be reacting as those things actually happen. We've been generating several alternatives, screening those through a series of criteria to really hone in on key, key preferred alternatives, I guess I would say, at these various locations. Um, again, in part to get your feedback and in part to help us understand what's the best bang for our buck or return on investment when that time comes. Um, we want to evaluate these alternatives against the goals and objectives that we established and, and really gather community input. Um, your, your thoughts, your um, concerns are important to inform this process. Um, and ultimately, the project team will be developing um, refined alternatives for future consideration and recommending a system of investments that help the county, help FAMPO, help VDOT identify and prioritize potential improvements um, as they may become necessary. So our goal overall for Route 1 is to develop a corridor that provides safe and comfortable travel, or travel for all uses and users of the roadway. So again, it's not just the mobility function and the trucks and vehicles that drive that corridor on a regular basis, but really being holistic and thinking about the emerging and increasing needs for pedestrian, bicycle, and even potentially transit um, needs. We want to improve incident management, manage access along the corridor effectively from safety perspective as well. Obviously, congestion is a concern. And again, as those emerging needs for more transit appear naturally through future development, we want to be proactive and identify ideal locations for those types of facilities um, to better the community. So where we are in the process, um, again, we, we had a public meeting earlier on in the process where we were really helping define the goals and objectives and taking your feedback into that process as well. We've developed a series of alternatives, screened those through some initial criteria, and really landed on you know, one or two key preferred alternatives that we are in the process of further evaluating. And part of that evaluation is getting your input. So we're here at the second public meeting. Um, when we're done with this public meeting this evening, there is going to be an online survey available for you and others to take. So we really encourage your participation in that. Um, we're gonna take that feedback that we get from you all, um, make any revisions or updates, adjustments to our alternatives, and ultimately produce our final report, which is gonna produce those preferred alternatives, if you will, and, and really um, set this corridor up for success in the long term. Okay. 
And so these next few slides are going to summarize what we've learned so far from the study, and they're primarily a recap of the first virtual public meeting we had a few months ago. So taking a look at the existing corridor, it's characterized by a patchwork and of inconsistent uh, pedestrian and bicycle facilities. Existing facilities include a few short stretches of sidewalk near signalized intersections, none of which have signalized crossings or crosswalks. With that being said, there are a few uh, projects currently funded to add pedestrian crossings at Mud Tavern Road and Morris Road as part of the Mud Tavern Road widening project. The study team also reviewed five years of the latest crash data along the study quarter and found that a little less than half of the crashes occurred at intersections. The intersections where the most crashes include Mud Tavern Road, Massaponics Church Road, Hickory Ridge Road, and Arcadia Road. And the first two being have intersections with the highest volumes, the latter two relatively low volumes, so those are certainly areas of concern. The study team evaluated existing traffic conditions during the morning and evening rush hours to understand the typical amount of congestion that motorists experience on the corridor. Most study intersections perform at or above capacity during uh, existing peak hours. One intersection in particular, Guinea Station Road, uh, performs with high levels of delay during both the morning and uh, evening rush hours. And as many of you may have traveled that intersection, it experiences significant delays uh, trying to pull out of Guinea Station Road under existing conditions. The study team also projected volumes out to 2030. So we took a look at what we call a 2030 no build scenario, where we incorporate future developments as Chris and Kyle alluded to, as well as future transportation improvements. So known transportation improvements include the widening of Mud Tavern Road, which is a VDOT project, and the signalization of Old Telegraph Road via the new Jackson Village Boulevard. So if no other changes were made, roughly half of the study intersections would be anticipated to perform at or over capacity during the morning and evening rush hours. You can see that in the change from green to more yellow and orange in the 2030 scenario. The study team gathered additional feedback on existing conditions through a preliminary round of community engagement. An online survey collected over 470 responses, and the study team also heard a, a virtual community meeting with the public to introduce the project goals and collect additional feedback on areas of concern. The preliminary community engagement re revealed that nearly 1% of travelers today walk or bike along Route 1. But the study also identified that a much higher percentage would like to do so and aren't doing so today. So the top four transportation issues identified by the survey include traffic congestion, speeding, the location and quality of sidewalks, and access to driveways. So together with the stakeholder group, the study team has developed a series of transportation options for Route 1. So, and all the options that are about to be shown have been vetted for their potential to improve both operations and safety performance along the corridor. And again, as, as Kyle and Chris mentioned, None of these are planned or currently funded. These are just options to be considered in the future when these new developments or traffic volumes grow along the corridor. So we'll be looking to get your feedback on some of these options because these, again, uh, can be amended in the next stages of the project. But it's important to keep in mind that these are all improvements in terms of operations and safety to the 2030 no build scenario. After reviewing Route 1's crash history, its existing and future operations, and feedback from the public and stakeholders, the study team is proposing several corridor-wide treatments as shown on this slide. A shared use path is being proposed on the east side of Route 1, except for a small portion on the west side by the future commuter, um, commuter lot. In general, the shared use path will follow the existing utility easements and power lines. In addition, the study team is proposing medians at specific locations to improve access management, as well as rumble strips and the use of curb and gutter to help define Route 1's shoulder to improve safety. One additional goal of the study is to explore options to expand transit along Route 1. While no transit routes currently operate along this corridor, the study team is proposing transit stops at several locations for future consideration based on projected land uses and densities. These include the new commuter lot, as well as additional stations near Loudland Drive, Massaponics Church Road, River Run Parkway, and Mud Tavern Road. In addition, the study team is proposing two key technologies to improve the user experience along Route 1. The first of which is automated traffic signal performance measures. This technology can be added to existing and proposed signals along Route 1 to collect and analyze signal timing data 24-7. The benefit of this is that traffic signals can be managed more proactively. 
Local jurisdictions can receive comprehensive data that will allow them to allocate future resources more efficiently and identify high priority locations. The second of which is Travel Time Variable Message Board. By implementing this technology at key locations, such as the Mud Tavern Road intersection, drivers can be alerted of anticipated delays, including those along I-95. This will allow for drivers to make informed route choices. We'll now walk through proposed improvements at each of the individual study intersections. Starting from the north end of the corridor, the first intersection is Old Telegraph Road. There are a few planned improvements at this intersection that are independent of this project, including the development of a commuter parking lot on the west side of Route 1. This is expected to serve as a key location for carpooling and transit access. The approved Jackson Village development will also be establishing a new connection over I-95 via the construction of Jackson Village Parkway. In this plan, Old Telegraph Road will be disconnected from Route 1 and the new Jackson Village Parkway intersection will become signalized. If no additional improvements were to be made, vehicles exiting the commuter lot are anticipated to experience high delays due to heavy southbound volumes expected on Route 1. Potential improvements to address this issue could include adding an acceleration lane out of the planned commuter lot to reduce delays. The southbound left turn lane at the planned signal could also be extended to prevent anticipated queuing from spilling back into southbound mainline traffic on Route 1. This next slide shows close-ups of the acceleration lane coming out of the commuter lot and the merged downstream of the signal on the right. Considering south, our second study intersection is at Route 1 and Ladland Drive. If no changes are made to this unsignalized intersection, vehicles attempting to exit Ladland Drive during the weekday rush hours anticipated to experience high delays. In addition to the inconvenience of drivers, the high delays may lead to drivers forcing their way into smaller gaps in mainline traffic to get out, which may lead to a potential increase in angle crashes at the intersection. So we have several options to, to take a look at at this one. One option to alleviate both the anticipated delays and the potential for angle crashes is to develop a restricted crossing U-turn intersection, or RCUT for short. This configuration restricts left turns movements out of Ladland Drive through the installation of a median along Route 1. To make a left-hand turn out of Ladland Drive, drivers will make a right turn onto Route 1 and proceed to a downstream U-turn location. Creating this two-stage left turn maneuver not only reduces delays experienced, but also reduces the likelihood of angle crashes by reducing the number of conflict points at each turn location. Widening Route 1 to develop the necessary medians, however, would require some right away along the existing property frontage. A close up is shown on the next slide. So, here you can see on the left uh, the median added along Route 1 to create that U turn location on the north end, as well as the, the islands in the center of the main intersection to restrict left turns out of uh, Ladland Drive, as well as the commercial entrance to the north. The photo on the right illustrates the southern U turn location, which allows drivers to directly access the right turn lane into Gateway Boulevard. Another option to improve both delays and the anticipated safety performance at Ladland Drive would be develop a peanut or dog bone roundabout. This enlarged roundabout extends down to Gateway Boulevard to help maintain full access to the church, college, and planned business park. The roundabout would naturally slow vehicles down on Route 1 in this area, which was identified by community members as a key area of speeding today. This option is anticipated to have greater reductions in delay to minor street movements relative to the arc cut. It does, however, come with slightly greater impacts to properties directly adjacent to the main intersection. For those trying to access the property shown in the bottom of the image, a driveway could be provided between the two nodes to help maintain access. Route 1 at Massaponics Church Road is the next intersection. If no changes are made to the signalized intersection of, at, of Route 1 in Massaponics Church Road, demand for left turning maneuvers from Massaponics Church Road would exceed capacity, resulting in high delays and long queues at the signal. In addition, this intersection was among those that experienced the highest frequency of crashes. To improve delays at this intersection, the addition of left turn lanes on Massaponics Church Road would help separate minor street left turns from the through movements. Adjustments to the signal phasing would, would also reduce the potential for crashes involving minor street left turns. 
The addition of signalized pedestrian crossings and a pedestrian refuge island in the northeast quadrant will help connect the planned trail running along the length of Route 1. One of the key study intersections event identified in both the existing conditions and future 2030, notes, uh, 2030 operation analyses was at Route 1 and Guinea Station Road. Guinea Station Road serves as a key access point for parents and students accessing Massaponic Church High School and is the only means of accessing the northern parking lot. Attempting to pull out of Guinea Station Road during the weekday rush hour proves difficult due to heavy volumes on Route 1. The walk through a series of improvements both near and long term, recognizing future roadway connections identified in the Spotsylvania County Comprehensive Plan. The first option is something that can be done in the near term. By simply connecting the northern school parking lot to the southern lots, school-related traffic on Guinea Station Road could access Route 1 via the existing signal at River Run Parkway. This low-cost improvement would address many of the operational and safety concerns experienced at Guinea Station Road today. In conjunction with the new internal school connection, operations at Guinea Station Road can be improved by developing a roundabout. A roundabout would be a great option to help manage vehicular speeds near the school. However, the roundabout at Guinea Station Road would require some additional right-of-way acquisition and would have a higher initial construction cost relative to other short-term options. In its comprehensive plan, Spotsylvania County is planning for a future extension of Guinea Station Road up to Massaponic Church Road, which you can see in the center of the screen with the red arrow pointing to that new connection. In the short, the short-term three-legged roundabout can accommodate this future connection by simply adding a fourth leg to the roundabout. No additional widening or construction would be required along Route 1 to accommodate this new eastbound approach. A second option, which was suggested in the first round of community outreach, is a traditional traffic signal. In the short term, prior to the extension of Guinea Station Road, the three-legged signal will provide regular gaps for vehicles attempting to exit Guinea Station Road onto Route 1. And this signal could be closely coordinated with the adjacent signal to the south at River Run Parkway to help maintain throughput along Route 1. When Guinea Station Road is extended to Massaponic Church Road in the future, the traditional signal can be modified into a quadrant roadway, which we'll show in a second. And under this configuration, left turns from Guinea Station Road are restricted and directed to the new extension of River Run Parkway. So you can see on the left there where the, just a high level layout of where that extension of River Run Parkway would be. And you can see with the yellow arrows, westbound left turns from Guinea Station would drive straight through the intersection of Route 1 and use the extension of River Run Parkway to complete a right turn at the existing signal, which is essentially their, their left turn. And with the red arrows, eastbound left turns would turn right onto River Run Parkway prior to ever reaching Route 1 and complete their left turn maneuver at the existing signal of River Run Parkway. By shifting both of these left turns away from the uh, intersection of Route 1 and Guinea Station, we can make the signal operate more efficiently. The next study intersection is at Hickory Ridge Road. In 2030, this intersection is anticipated to be above capacity in the morning and evening peak hours. In addition, this intersection was among those that experienced the highest number of crashes. One option to address these challenges is a restricted crossing U-turn intersection, also known as an R-cut. An R-cut here would restrict left turn movements out of Hickory Ridge and adjacent driveways through the installation of a median. To make a left turn movement, drivers will need to take a right and complete a U-turn downstream. As Andy previously described, the benefits of R-cuts are the reduced travel delays and reduced likelihood of crashes. However, it will require some minor, minor out-of-direction travel and right-of-way acquisition to accommodate the median. The shared use path along this section of Route 1 can be ran under existing power lines. This next slide shows the new configuration of Hickory Ridge with the restricted egress as well as the U-turn location. A second option to consider at Hickory Ridge Road is a roundabout. This option is expected to have better overall operations despite some minor delay added to the mainline traffic on Route 1. Movements from Hickory Ridge are expected to be more efficient and safer as the number of conflict points are reduced. Like the arc cut option, right away would need to be required while access to existing properties are maintained. So next intersection, North Rock Sparrow Road experiences both operational and safety challenges today due to its skewed approach to Route 1. Many drivers noted they do not feel safe turning into or out of North Rock Sparrow Road due to low visibility and a lack of turn lanes. 
One low cost option would be to simply close North Rock Experimental off from Route 1. Drivers currently using this intersection would be diverted down to Lock and True Road, which has better visibility and existing turn lanes. But recognizing that closing off the road may not be the most popular option, if maintaining access to North Roxbury Mill is a priority, the intersection could be restricted to right in, right out only. Egress from North Roxbury Mill Road would be accommodated via an acceleration lane to prevent drivers from having to turn nearly 180 degrees to see cars coming from uh, the southbound direction. Under the scenario, southbound left turns on North Roxbury Mill Road are prohibited and are directed to use Lock and True Road. The third option, which is a slight variation on option two, widens Route 1 to provide a left turn lane into the existing church on the west side of Route 1. Feedback received from the community illustrated that there are existing issues with turns in and out of the church today. This option could be achieved with coordination and financial contribution from the church. The next study intersection is at North Point Drive and Larkin Chew Road. In 2030, this intersection is anticipated to be nearing or above capacity in the morning and evening peak hours. In addition, this intersection serves as an access point to a school just west of the image shown on the slide. The study team explored two options at this location. Through our first public meeting, we heard interest at a signal at this location. The benefits of a signal here would be allows vehicles, including school buses, to enter Route 1. However, signals tend to have safety concerns related to angle and rear end crashes. High operational delays are still expected with the signal at this intersection. The study team also looked at a roundabout. A roundabout here would decrease the number of conflict points and therefore reduce the expected number of crashes. As previously mentioned, roundabouts help manage vehicular speeds to allow efficient movement through the intersection. A challenge of a roundabout at this location is the higher initial construction cost. However, this cost is expected to be offset through lower annual cost. So the study area near South Roxbury Mill Road and the signal at Mud Tavern Road is programmed to see several improvements come online prior to 2030, as Kyle mentioned. The first Mud Tavern Road and Morse Road are uh, planned to be widened with turn lanes and pedestrian infrastructure being added to signal. A new connector road is also being constructed to the east of Route 1 to provide alternative means of accessing Mud Tavern Road and Route 1 from South Roxbury, and South Roxbury Mill Road. With these improvements, however, South Roxbury Mill Road is forecast to operate above capacity and vehicles attempting to access Route 1 are anticipated to experience high delays. So to enhance the many great improvements already planned for this area, we've identified a few low cost alternatives. The first involves converting South Roxbury Mill Road to right in, right out egress, oh, excuse me, right out egress only, which will improve the anticipated overcapacity operations. Drivers on the South Roxbury Mill Road looking to travel south on Route 1 can still do so via the planned connector road and the signal at Mud Tavern Road. The proposed plan also includes extending the southbound left turn lane at the signal within the existing median to help prevent Q spillbacks during the peak hours onto uh, Q spillbacks onto the mainline US 1. And here we can see the shared use path, which has been diverted to run along Roxbury Mill Road, would be tied back into Route 1 at the signal. Our final study intersection is at Arcadia Road. Through discussions with our stakeholders and feedback from the first public meeting, safety and speeding are the primary concerns at this intersection. To address both concerns, the study team is proposing a couple of options, the first of which is to restrict Arcadia Road to ride in, ride out movements. Drivers that previously used this intersection to turn left could do so at Marie Road, which is anticipated to operate below capacity even with this additional traffic. This option is expected to reduce the, reduce the number of severe angle crashes, but would require out of direction travel for some exiting Arcadia Road. The second option is to realign Arcadia Road by extending Plantation Estates Way. The benefit of this option is that it would create a perpendicular approach, which would create safer turning movements by improving visibility. However, this option would be expensive as right away will need to be purchased. And we'll give it just a second for the PowerPoint to catch up. Sorry, yep, everyone froze on my end. <laughs> so here you can see Plantation Estates Way being extended to Route 1. Um, so it would just be moving the intersection over, but would require extensive right away costs.
Okay. Um, so with those intersections and the overview, I uh, wanted just to close out the presentation portions, highlighting what the next steps for our study are. And uh, first and foremost, um, again, we're here to hear from the community and get your input. And so we will be, uh, there's an alternatives survey, which provides all this information and provides you an opportunity uh, to provide comments on that here at the, uh, the website address shown. And our study website, again, um, hosted by Virginia DOT can be found right there. And again, in that, uh, in that, that survey opportunity, um, we'd really like to hear what you like or maybe don't like or have concerns about. Um, both of those things are important. Um, your, your input is really vital to helping shape the future of this corridor and the options that would potentially be considered along it. And I know I speak for the stakeholders as well as VDOT um, in, in, encouraging you to provide that feedback to us in in all these different formats if you if you can so um, as we look at the project schedule again we're we're in this process of evaluating these different alternatives and and bringing that uh, information to the public for your feedback um, we're going to have this online survey open for a couple weeks for another you know opportunity to share um, we're going to take all of that feedback and information and revise alternatives, make some adjustments potentially to some of these things. Um, and then we're gonna bring those back to the core stakeholder group to share those. And then we will transition as a project team into summarizing the final recommended improvements um, and, and produce a final report that really encompasses the full uh, study from inception all the way through to completion. Um, and right now that's uh, targeted to end in August. So we're, we're coming up on it quickly and uh, we're excited to get your feedback here. And I think we're just waiting for the slide. So what happens after the study is completed? Um, there's, again, as, as Kyle and, and Paul noted early on, again, we're, we're identifying potential long-term solutions for this corridor. Um, many of these improvements at the intersection level could be funded through funding programs such as Smart Scale. Um, again, you know the Smart Scale process. You know localities make applications. They are scored and ranked and prioritized across the state for funding. If those are identified and selected, then they are entered into the the state's six-year plan. Uh, for construction. So, um, you know, we're still probably several years away from even seeing some of these things potentially being improved, but that's exactly why we looked out to the year 2030, um, trying to stay ahead of the game here. Um, so, so I could definitely see some of these projects becoming smart scale applications and going into that process. Um, if they were selected, those designs would be further refined, developed, a full environmental analysis would be done as needed. There would be additional opportunities for community engagement and feedback through that process. Um, and obviously if it is selected for funding, um, it would be identified with the target construction date. Um, and typically in the six year plan, six years away from when it's funded is when you're gonna actually see construction start to occur. So, um, and that timeline can vary as we know. So those are some of the next potential steps if we look way down, way down the timeline. So that's gonna complete our presentation of the alternatives and the material tonight. Again, um, in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, if you're participating through a tablet or your computer, um, you have an opportunity to ask a question in the chat function at the bottom right. And um, we would certainly encourage you to do that if you have any questions or comments. and and I'll turn it back over to Kelly, I guess, maybe as we transition to that. Thanks, Chris. Uh, we don't actually have, we don't have any questions at the moment, but okay. again, um, there's time. If you, if you think of one, just go ahead and type it right into that box in the lower right-hand corner. Um, it could be a comment or a question. And we also will have time to accept questions and comments by phone. Um, I don't actually currently see anyone joining by phone, but after we take comments by chat, we'll pivot over to see if there is anyone by phone, but it looks like we did have one question come in. So I'll turn it over to the, the study team to address that one from Nate. 
Yes, thank you, Nate. Our first question is considering some of the time frame for completion, the six years, wouldn't it be prudent to use more effective solution as opposed to less expensive options? So Andy, would you like to take a take that one? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And we want to make sure that we're providing a wide range of solutions, recognizing that some of the most robust solutions that may solve all of the issues or most of the issues may be a challenge to get more uh, funding secured in the long term. So we want to present both low cost options that could solve things in the say more interim before 2030, as well as options that can solve 2030 and beyond, recognizing that things may change between 2030 and 2040. Um, so taking providing those choices, because if things prove more difficult to get funding, at least there's some interim options that could be done at a, at a low cost way to, to solve at least some of the issues. Because we'd all love to have funding for all of these, but realistically, it does take time to secure that funding. So I don't know if any of our VDOT staff participants would love to uh, address that as well. We're not hearing anything. Um, perhaps we can move on to the next question. Um, does the study team have thoughts on which intersections are higher priorities to address in the smart scale or other programs? So yeah, hand it back to you, Andy. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's a great question, Paul. There certainly are some that we're seeing both operational and safety issues today, and those are you know only anticipated to get worse as more traffic and developments come in along Route One. So. Um, Probably the, the main priority that we've seen from a traffic operations perspective is Guinea Station Road. We're seeing both uh, operational concerns in the weekday AM and PM rush hours, and we're seeing some safety concerns with people having trouble getting out into traffic. So they're taking maybe smaller gaps than they should just because they're not finding those gaps and through traffic on Route 1. So you know, all of these are important intersections with their own um, challenges shown through the operational and safety analyses, but that's probably a higher priority. Um, I don't know, Chris or Liz, if there's, there's others you believe that would probably take a higher priority, but ultimately that's up to the stakeholder group too to help propose which ones they wanna get, get funded first. Yeah, Andy, I, th I think that summarizes it pretty well. I, you know, obviously there's a strong correlation to operational and safety concerns both and, and different intersections along the corridor are experiencing different degrees of that today. So I think that's a natural prioritization there. Um, you know, if we see an opportunity to reduce or eliminate crashes, especially, you know, high frequency locations or high severity locations, I think that would be a natural, a natural win and an easy prioritization. Um, but that's really, you know, part of the community outreach and input process is, is understanding that, that fuller fabric and and so you know your comments and feedback to this process is really important because that that feeds into that prioritization process as well. Great. Thank you both. Um perhaps this next question I'll hand it over to Kyle. Has the peanut roundabout been recently implemented in Virginia? I do not know anywhere off the top of my head where that's the case. Um, I, I would have to push it out to, to the VDOT team. I know we have our traffic engineer, uh, Peter Hedrick, and our our um, district planner, uh, Stephen Haynes, on the line. Do you Are you all aware of any other locations where they have a peanut roundabout? So this is Stephen. I do not know of any that have been constructed. I do know that one will be constructed prior to the opportunity we would have here. Uh, in downtown Fredericksburg, uh, there's, you know, it's funded. And uh, so we like that design and that's what sort of sparked our interest in it here. Uh, but it certainly is a, uh, it would be a good, I, you know, me, I'm a roundabout crazy guy. I love roundabouts. So uh, I'd love to see uh, more of these come about if we could. Yeah, if there's a better solution, uh, we'll go with that. I think one thing I wanted to sort of bring in and bring my own question into this is that people that are listening may uh, be interested in. 
some of these things we had multiple uh, alternatives uh, that we've considered and that we'll continue to consider. And I think the question would be, uh, what is the likelihood of us continuing on with the study recommending more than one alternative, or will we actually whittle it down to a single alternative? Um, and I don't know what my thoughts are on it, but I was wondering if anyone on the team would want to, you know, have any opinion about that. That's a hot potato, Stephen. But uh, I'll I'll take a stab at it. I, 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 th I think at this at this planning level, um, I think it's important to, um, you know, we've already gone through a screening process. You know, there were initially even more alternatives at each of these locations, at, le at least initially, uh, conceived of and thought through at a higher level. But it was pretty clear that you know the one or two or three that you've seen this evening are were really the ones that rose to the top as, you know, this optimization of most feasible, uh, you know, most effective, and yet still, um, you know, relatively possible in the land of limited funding. You know, I, I think, you know, there, there are some great ideas out there, uh, but, you know, cost is always an issue. And I think we're trying to be pragmatic about that as well. But from from I guess from my perspective, I'll just speak for myself. I, I, I like being able to bring one or two options at a location forward in the final document and not simply say this is, you know, this one thing is the only thing that can work here. I think it speaks to that naturally by doing that. And and again, it, it promotes further discussion and and keeps the the range of alternatives, if you will, broader as as opportunities do arise for funding or applications into a smart scale program or, or wherever the funding might come from. And Liz, do you want to jump back? I think we skipped over one question, so I don't want to lose that one from, I think it was Lisa Brooks. Yep, so this is just kind of continuing on the discussion for roundabouts. Have the roundabouts been studied when I-95 backs up? So when Route 1 is being used um, as a secondary option to the I-95. So Chris, I'll hand that back to you to talk about, you know, roundabouts during congestion. Sure. Um, well, I can, I can start, and if Andy, you want to add anything. Um, so the short answer is is yes. We we did perform a certain amount of uh, sensitivity, if you will, um, recognizing that this portion of Route One in particular is often used as an alternative route during during incidents on I ninety five, whether those be in a single direction or in both directions. Um, you know, the nice thing about roundabouts is is that. Um, I think they're actually more dynamic and adaptable to uh, situations um, than even traffic signals can be to a certain extent. And I think we also have to recognize that at a certain level of traffic shifting over to Route 1, any intersection, regardless of the control form in its place, may require additional you know, trooper or police flagging to just manage the amount of traffic in the short term. Um, but but roundabouts in general, the roundabouts are shown to have a tremendous amount of capacity um, to maintain mainline flows and still keep side street or the, the secondary street approaches at a, a more reasonable level through a broader range of, of travel and traffic demands. Great, thanks, Chris. Um, it looks like the next one is for VDOT. So maybe Kyle, you can decide if you want to take this one. Does VDOT envision multiple roundabouts and locations that meet separation distances for signals on Route 1? Well, the good thing about roundabouts is they're going to keep people moving throughout the process. So whereas we have queuing issues with the signals and then you're dumping a platoon of traffic onto the next signal, which could potentially cause issues, you won't necessarily have that with the roundabout. Um, you know, I, I would like to pass it to uh, to Peter. Uh, did you want to speak to that? Well, good evening. Um, yeah, the you have less issues with spacing with the roundabouts than you than you might with the uh, traffic signals. Uh, you do get a more more continuous flow in the roundabouts, so you get a smoother flow. Um, we do need to maintain spacing between roundabouts and 
and traffic signals so you don't have them interfering with one another. But uh, generally speaking, um, with a roundabout continuous flow process, um, the queuing becomes less of an issue, so your spacing is less of an issue roundabouts. Thank you, Peter. I appreciate that. So, so to to answer your question, Leon, um, as Peter had said, that spacing requirement is going to be a little bit different. So, it may open for some opportunities. So. A question on Kyle's beard. So, <laughs> well, I, I, I don't know. I still saw one other question. I wanted to make sure we got it. Um, so the question was, um, I wasn't at the first meeting, but were jug handles reviewed in order to keep traffic flowing faster, less lights needed, um, and getting rid of all the usual turn lanes uh, was the comment slash question. Um, and so I would, I would essentially say that. Um, the, the, the R cut options that you saw, the restricted crossing U-turn options is effectively a form of a, of a, of a quadrant or a, a jug handle. Um, the challenge with jug handles is oftentimes the, the amount of right of way it would take to swing that out. And you may still need a traffic signal to process the traffic at that crossing location. Whereas the R cuts, at least in the locations that we have presented them this evening, um, would all be unsignalized. So you don't have that signal infrastructure to maintain and construct and pay for. You also don't have um, the delays that the traffic signals inherently introduce um, for everybody. Um, the R cuts basically affect, you know, efficiently process that left turn demand with a minor amount of out of direction travel. And I think it's important to remember that despite the out of direction travel, the the, uh, the alternative or the do nothing alternative is you're waiting to make that left turn for a much longer period of time than you would have. So, you know, if you imagine the before condition sitting in a queue of four or five cars trying to turn left onto US one when it's busy and maybe waiting two, three minutes before you can even make that left turn in an R cut configuration, you're going to be able to make that maneuver and literally traverse to the same point at which you would have made that left turn in a matter of 20 seconds. And, and so you actually save a tremendous amount of travel time, even though it was a little bit further out of direction, if you will. Okay, I do want to give, uh, we do have one person who's joined us by phone. I want to make sure that person has an opportunity. Um, you may just be listening in, but if you do wish to make a comment, if you just would like to hit star three on your phone, that'll raise your hand and let us know that you would like to ask a question or make a comment. Again, that's just to hit star three on your keypad and you'll let us know that you've, you're interested in making a comment or asking a question. I'll keep looking for a moment, but I don't see anything immediately. Um, and while we wait, I'll turn it back over to the study team just to see if there are any any thoughts as we as we wait to see if there are any last minute questions. Okay. Well, okay. <laughs> If not, I really appreciate everyone coming out tonight. Um, and we'd, we'd look to get further input if you have it on the specific improvements or options that were presented. So uh, let's just go to the next slide. We have the, the link. Uh, so you can see the study website here at uh, virginiadot.org slash route one Spotsylvania. It is also the survey is at that bit.ly link, which will be on the study website. It'll be a little easier to type if you just go to the study website and click it from there. And we'd love to hear your, your thoughts so you can take the time. I know we kind of went through some of these a little bit quickly, but you can take the time to review all of the individual options that were presented on the project website. You can click on a, a PDF link of them, review them in, in detail. If you think of any other questions, uh, you can certainly pose them or if you have any 
concerns or things that you like, feel free to, to enter those through the survey after after tonight's meeting, because we'd, we'd love to get your feedback before we uh, kind of wrap up the study and, and put together these recommendations. Yeah, Andrew and the uh, study team, is the presentation that was given tonight on the website? Hi, Paul. It'll be um, posted immediately after we finish here. Okay. Uh, great job tonight. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, well, with that, we appreciate everyone's time this evening and we will be posting these slides um, momentarily and then the actual recording of this meeting tonight. It does take some time to download. Uh, we do post it to YouTube and then post the link on the project page. And sometimes that process takes about 24 hours, but we do hope to have it up by tomorrow evening. And again, if there's any question or concern that comes to mind after this, um, please do feel free to send it to us at the Fred comments email address, um, call us and we will have it addressed. Thank you so much and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Nice. Thanks, bye.